Uh, you mentioned that uh, you have the ability to get people to do uh, more than they thought, and I was wondering if you could tell us how you did that. Well, you give someone a project. It's a difficult project. They don't think they could do it. So you encourage them to do it. And say, don't worry. If you make a mistake, we'll accept that. And you push them to do things and work harder than they thought they, they otherwise would. And when they succeed, they feel pretty good about themselves and move on to something else. Hi, my name is Tanya Uthgrove. I'm with the Weekend MBA program. And my question is about um, the partnerships that need to be aligned to address some of the challenges within K through 12 education. I'm curious to find out what advice you have to uh, those in the business sector as well as those in education about how they can work strategically in order to transform education here within our country. Well, I think the first thing we all have to do is, uh, is really, really be involved one way or another in saying, look, we're not satisfied with the system. Uh, we we want to do better. We want to change the system. We want to use technology. We want younger, better teachers. Uh, we want to get rid of a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, and we, we've got to excel because it's our future, whether it's from a social, political point of view or an economic point of view. And uh, it, it's tough going because there are a lot of interests that want to maintain the status quo. There, there's no secret formula. Going in line with uh, your thoughts on K through 12 education, um, you know, a lot of people talk about privatization versus, or a voucher system that would give people choice. What, in, in your view, with your, edu with your, I guess, background in this, would be your solution or proposed solution to help fix the K through 12 education issue? Well, I, th I think you need, you need choice. I think you need competition between public schools, whether they're regular public schools or public charter schools. In higher ed, you've got competition between public universities, private universities, and so on. We need more of that. We need to get parents more involved. We've got to provide them data so they can choose the best schools for their kids, not simply going to school in your neighborhood because it's there. Uh, we've got to do a better job with, in, 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 uh, in creating uh, better teachers. We create too many teachers in America, but not, not enough science teachers or math teachers. Uh, I went to a school in Northern California called Rocket Ship that uses technology. 75% of those teachers are Teach for America teachers, young teachers from the best liberal arts colleges and elsewhere in America. And they're doing wonderful things. So there's, there's a lot that needs to be done. Mr. Broad, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you for coming. Uh, as a current entrepreneur who's often been accused of going after an opportunity that's unreasonably ambitious, what that I can assure you is a logical, asymmetric opportunity, mm. how do I garner the support from some of the conventional players that I need to move forward given that, that inherent conflict? Well, I think if one has good ideas and some ability to, pers to, to, to persuade people, you get support. I don't think there's any magic formula. You have to have you have to have a good idea. You got to prove to people that it's really going to work, whatever it's whether it's a service or a product, and and you've got to convince them. And if you can't convince the first uh, person or group, you move on to the next one. Hi, Eli. I'm over here on your left. <laughs> Brandon Montez, I'm a full-time MBA here and actually also got my undergrad degree in accounting from MSU like you. Uh, in your book, you talk a lot about setting really challenging goals uh, for people or for organizations. What are some of the challenging or unreasonable goals that you would uh, set for the business college here? And maybe you can give us an idea of how you might accomplish some of those goals. Well, when, when we made our gift some 20 years ago, the challenge was how do we get uh, a more diverse faculty rather than a Midwestern faculty? Some of that's been accomplished. How do we get better students? So we had some scholarships. How do we get up in the rankings from where we were to the top 20? That's been difficult. It's a very competitive area for, uh, 
business schools and graduate schools of uh, business and management. Th those were some of the things. So progress has been made, but uh, we've got a ways to go here at Michigan State. But we're great in a number of areas. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Alicia Lesko. I'm a, a full-time MBA as well. Um, my question is regarding philanthropy. You speak a lot about a personal responsibility for philanthropy, um, but what about corporations? What role does uh, corporate America have in being a force for positive change? I think corporate America has an important role, and I still remember, it might have been 20 years ago, when someone talked about uh, to corporate leadership about social costs of what they were doing. In fact, it was Ralph Nader, I still remember, I met him for the first time. And it was interesting. Uh, I, th I, th I think American business has become more responsible than they were 10 or 20 years ago in a number of areas. Sometimes they have to be pushed to become more responsible, whether it's the auto industry or other industries. But it's happening and they, they do have a great role to play. I had a question. If you could start over again and be a freshman at Michigan State, would you do anything differently with your life? Well, look, the world has changed since I started here in 1951. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, we didn't have all the technology we're not all accustomed to. We, we didn't have all that was happening in science and so on. Uh, so days were different. So if I was a student now, I, I, I probably... Uh, you still do accounting. Uh, well, accounting was a, good, it was a good foundation. But I might take some engineering courses That's fine. and a number of other things <laughs> at the same fine. time and, and wander into uh, things that are, weren't around 60 years ago. Fine. I know you. Going, going back through the K through 12 experience, um, do you think that the uh, most serious problem in this country uh, has to do with the unions and tenure in dealing with getting qualified uh, teachers to uh, elevate the, uh, uh, and, and improve our educational process? Look, we've got a broken system. There's enough blame for everybody. But I do believe the tenure system does not make sense in K-12 education, nor does the seniority system, which has what we call life last in, first out where if, if you have to lay off teachers, they lay off them based on seniority and, instead of keeping the best young teachers. And they've got to change, uh, the American classroom has to change from what it's been for 200 years with 30 to 40 kids uh, sitting in rows and so on uh, by using technology. We're gonna to get to blended learning, which will be a big game changer in, uh, in K through 12 education. And we're seeing examples of that. And, uh, and I'm delighted that uh, uh, most of the change, frankly, has been coming from Washington. Whether it was No Child Left Behind, which wasn't perfect, or the race to the top, uh, and it forced 30, 40 states to change their laws. We now have 45 states that now have a common core curriculum. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that before. So we're making progress. It's slow, but hopefully it'll, it'll accelerate. My name is Nicolas. I'm an international student in full-time MBA program. Um, my question is, what do you think is the role of, of immigration in the future of the United States? The role of the? Immigration. Immigration. I think it's an important role. I, I, I wish anyone who got a doctorate would have a green card uh, attached to their diploma. Uh, this country has done extremely well with immigrants, whether it's uh, immigrants uh, uh, that have multiple degrees here or from elsewhere or immigrants in general. Uh, we're a country of immigrants and, and we've benefited from that and we've got to learn how to uh, uh, get even greater benefit than we have in the past. I hate to see people from India that get degrees whether it's here or Caltech or MIT uh, and they leave. I think we ought to do all we can to keep them here. I mean, Silicon Valley is a great example. Silicon of, Valley uh, is a great you know, example of that. What, what has happened with immigration, so. 
Uh, Shelly Salai, second year MBA, and I, my question is, how did you make the decision to leave a successful career in accounting and go out into entrepreneurship, and what suggestions do you have for those of us considering the same thing? I was in accounting for two years, and frankly, I, I, was, pretty, I was pretty good at it. But then, I must tell you, you know, I came from a lower middle class family, and I think I was earning something like $67.40 after taxes a week. And, and we had clients that I didn't think were that brilliant, home builders making lots of money. So I sort of said, maybe I could do that. So I studied, I went to see what was happening in other parts of the Midwest and home building and so on. I found a partner that had a background in construction. We created Kaufman & Broad with $25,000 of borrowed money. And off we went. My name is Paul Sato. I'm uh, a twice retired scientist. I'm uh, the, the weekend MBA student. And in my 45 years of my career, I found that none of my scientific co colleagues don't understand anything about business. <laughs> and well, they know all the thermodynamics and things like that. But then my CEOs and upper management, they don't know anything about science at all. <laughs> And uh, so I decided after retiring the second time, I, I got to go to business school and learn this, the language of business. Now, I try to unite these two different words, like C.P. Snow has said once. However, it's very difficult to go about it. Uh, engineering schools and science schools, they should restart teaching the importance of business to students. And then business schools, they should know how to take advantage of scientists. <laughs> However, I don't know how to go about it. And after I graduate, I will spend all the rest of my life uh, to spread the word of the importance of business I agree science. with you. I think you need greater collaboration between uh, the sciences, engineering, and business schools. And I think it's starting to happen here at Michigan State University and elsewhere. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Samir, a first-year MBA student. Uh, my question is, you said uh, you hire brilliant people. So in today's economic scenario with all the technology, what are the essential transferable skills you look for people to be successful in business or entrepreneurship in today's economic scenario? When I interviewed people, whether it was at various universities and so on, I did not simply want the person that had the, the greatest GPA or other things. I wanted people that were... Uh, unusual thinkers that were different, that uh, frankly uh, uh, would not be satisfied with the status quo, so to speak, and not just go with the flow. I'm not sure I've answered your question, but maybe I have. Matt Horwitz, uh, full-time MBA program. And you mentioned earlier about uh, giving someone that worked for you a challenge and then having them work on that before moving on to the next challenge and also if you were to come back to school, how you would also take some classes in engineering and other functions. How important is it, do you feel, for people like us entering into managerial type roles to continually move from one function to another? And how long do you think um, someone should stay within a function before they look to the next challenge to just expand on their knowledge base and to, to gain more knowledge within that corporation or to then maybe go to a different corporation? I think it's important to move around and a number of uh, companies like General Electric that have created great leaders uh, have people moving around to their various divisions, uh, whether they start in finance or elsewhere. I, I think it is important. I don't think you want to stay in any one thing for more than X number of years, whether it's three or five. Hi, my name is Macklin Fink. I'm an undergraduate accounting major. I would just like to know, uh, what's the greatest piece of personal or professional advice you've ever received? I'm not sure there's any one. You know, what I've learned very, very early is sort of uh, the harder you work, the luckier you get sort of thing. Uh, there, there's no one piece of professional. You, you try to learn from everyone, whether it's reading books on uh, great business leaders, whether it was Sloan at General Motors or others. So you, you get ideas. And again, if you read a uh, uh, number of newspapers a day and other things, uh, you, you learn, you get, you get advice. But there's no, there's no just one, 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 one piece of advice that uh, comes to mind that helped me be successful. 
Hi, um, I'm David Guo. Um, I'm a second year MBA student. I was wondering, in your opinion, uh, what are the most intriguing product or uh, customer niches today or in the future, in the near future? Well, clearly, uh, the internet changed the world. If you looked at all that's happening in, in Silicon Valley and elsewhere, including some things in Michigan, that's very exciting. And it's an area that I don't feel I'm very competent to, to, to comp comment on further, other than every week we see some great startups happening uh, in, in technology. I, I think biotech, with all that's happening in science, whether it's genomics or stem cell research, and the effect that's going to have on everything, on uh, improving the human condition, improving agriculture, and so on. There are a lot of areas out there that uh, weren't exactly around uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. I'm Mr. Broad. I'm uh, Andrew Dyke, a marketing undergrad. Um, I just was wondering what, uh, if you had one, what your single greatest piece of advice on the topic of entrepreneurship slash business is. Well, there's no one piece of advice. One, you've got to be a risk taker. The biggest risk is not taking any risk at all. And when you take a risk, you've got to measure what's the worst thing that can happen. When I left public accounting to go into home building, I said, what's the worst thing that can happen? I'll go back to being an accountant. Uh, or, you know, you know, you know yeah, you're yeah. killing me, Eli, you're killing me. No, 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 well, whatever, that, that might have been okay. In fact, I, you know, I'm, yeah, I, you know, I was fired from an accounting job. Oh, really? I think I wrote about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that is because you were asking for a pay raise every week. <laughs> uh, that's right. Some, yeah, when I was younger, I was maybe too aggressive in asking for a salary increase. It there got, you go. It yeah. got me fired. <laughs> you got fired for that. <laughs> Mr. Bro, thank you for being here today. My name is Tim Greiner. I have a bachelor's in music education and a couple of years of teaching experience. And uh, <clears throat> my limited experience, uh, I've noticed that education often gets a bad rap. And I feel that uh, the best students, and I, I agree that this is a very limited experience, but the best students often come from the best families and the best parents. And um, teachers are often, like I said, get a bad rap. What do you think about the accountability of parents in our uh, country? Because I, I feel like that is, you know, that's gone down dramatically over the past, you know, couple generations. And that, that, that is a huge part of why we've seen such a decline in our schools. Many or most American parents do not understand the need for giving their kids a great education. Uh, I think of other nations, whether it's Korea, India, China, Japan, certain European nations, where they value K-12 education far more than we do. Uh, I think we've got to educate parents that need to do more. We've got to give more data so they can make good choices for their kids on where they ought to go to school. And they ought to be more involved. Uh, unfortunately, the American people have been uh, very satisfied with the state of K-12 education. Uh, and that goes back, in my view, to what happened starting at the end of World War II. We came out of the, the war better than anyone. Uh, we thought we were a great nation. Then we had the GI Bill of Rights, which created uh, several decades of intellectual capital. Then we had the brightest people coming from Asia and Europe to be educated here. Uh, and that all worked. Well, it, 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 K-12 is not working because other nations uh, that were far behind us, uh, we used to have the number one graduation rate in the world. I think we're now 15th. In mathematics and science, we're 30th or 25th or whatever the exact number is. So parents and the public have got to understand that we've got to do better. And we've got to do better quick, quickly. My name is David, an undergraduate finance major. When starting your businesses, what was the biggest challenge you had to overcome and how did you overcome it? Well, the first thing, you, 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 I was rather young when we started. I was 23 years of age, and I did not look much older. So uh, people want to know uh, where my father was and so on. <laughs> but, so you, you just... Uh, you started think, wearing a suit. That's what you started doing. 
well, I wore a suit and, and so on. But uh, I, I think it was just convincing people that uh, I was serious, I knew what I was doing, the plans I had make sense, uh, and get them uh, uh, to help, whether it's banks or, or suppliers or subcontractors. Hi, I'm Jake Bauck. I'm part of the MS and Accounting program. You mentioned how the book, uh, the publisher wanted it to be a how-to rather than a biography. I was wondering if there's any specific experiences you've had that uh, have made you the man you are or helped you become where you are that you weren't able to fit into the book. Well, there are a number of things in the book that uh, I, I commented on and uh, reminisced about, I guess, that, that helped me. A uh, number of challenges I had. Uh, number of sacrifices I made uh, to get where I was. While the mic is going there, uh, there was something you say about personal finance, which was intriguing, and you talked about the importance of selecting an investment advisor rather than trying to select individual stocks. Um, why is that? Well, I believe this to the general public, I don't think the general public ought to be, uh, uh, without training, ought to be buying individual securities or listening to a stockbroker buy this or buy that, as opposed to listening to a financial advisor or, or, or buying uh, mutual funds of some note. I, I, I think it's a risky, risky activity yes, buying yes. individual stocks unless they know the company very well, know the industry, and have some financial training. Eli, we want to thank you for being here. I want to do, a, if I can, a bit of translation. Uh, when, when you say reading four newspapers a day, it means reading all the things that are not specifically what you're interested in. It's all the things you're not interested in. Whereas with the computer today, there's an easy way of me programming something that's very narrow, and mm -hmm. forgetting all the things that I'm not interested in. And I think part of the translation might be to the students that they've got to sort of be sure that they, no matter how busy they are, deal with all the things that they're not interested in right there at that moment. Not all, but a good number of things. You know, I read every paper in a different way. I start with local paper for local news and sports. Uh, and I, I really don't. I glance at the business section. The business section, is, uh, I, I go to the New York Times and Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times. Then in the arts, I read paper, papers. So, you know, I spent almost two hours a day. If I read every page of every paper, it would take a lot more than that. As a kid, I was dyslexic, so I'm not, I'm not a fast reader. I got over dyslexia, but I'm not a fast reader. My name is Alex Westwood. Over here to your left. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm a, uh, a full-time MBA student. I want to say first thank you for the contributions you've made that have made this opportunity possible for nearly everyone here in this room. I appreciate it. Um, I come from a family of teachers. My wife's a teacher. I have several other relatives who are teachers. And, and while I've looked at the, the Broad Residency Program, is I don't know that that's where I want to devote all of my time. Do you have recommendations for how a graduating MBA or other graduate can contribute to the, the effort to change K through 12 education without being involved in it full time? Well, you, you can do it as a volunteer in various ways. Let me tell you what we did. When we got involved in K through 12 education, I said, we're not experts in curriculum. We're not experts in in teaching, but I know something about mm -hmm. governance and management. So we started in those areas, and the most successful programs we've had have been the Superintendents Academy, where we now have 40 superintendents running urban school districts. And then after several years, I said, you know what? I don't see any people with MBAs or similar degrees from our best schools being involved in urban school district mm -hmm. management or administration. So we create a program called the residency. We now have 300 of those people out there working for whether they're governors, the US Department of Education, superintendents in urban school districts across America. And they're making a big difference. You know, it's, our daughter is uh, in Teach for America. 
and uh, she got selected for that. And I, I'm thinking about that program and several other like that that are out there. And despite all of that activity, it seems strange that K through 12 should still be at the- Look, he, we've been early supporters of Teach for America. Wendy Kopp, mm -hmm. uh, who went to Princeton on her, uh, her, her thesis uh, to create Teach for America, her professor said, this is never gonna work, by the way. Uh, so after 20 some odd years, she's done wonders and a number of so-called core members they've had out there is outstanding. In fact, there are quite a few now in Detroit amongst other places. But it's a beginning. You know, charter schools have grown dramatically, but it's still a very small, very small market share. Other in the few cities, whether it's New Orleans, Washington, uh, Harlem, and elsewhere, where they are making a difference. Uh, and then you've got other places like Houston, Texas, where someone uh, took uh, the ideas of charter schools and is using uh, it in 25 public schools, which are become very successful. Hi, Mr. Bro, my name is Deepa Varghese. I'm up here. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, my question is, where do you think the government's focus should be on when it comes to the economy and fixing it? Should it be more on concentrating on education and investing in education for the future? Or should it be on um, focusing on businesses and bringing them back on top, like American businesses? Well, <laughs> I, I think I think our government has to be. I'm not sure "friendly" is the right word. It's got to work with business uh, to make sure that uh, we're, we're getting a job done, that we're we're competitive worldwide and the like. With regard to education, I think there's clearly a role for the federal government, and state governments, to demand change in public education. And some of that is happening, and I think we have to have more happening. And I mentioned earlier, you now have a, a common core, 45 states, uh, with a common core curriculum, which we didn't have before. We now have 30-some-odd states that have changed their laws uh, with regard to charter schools, evaluation of teachers, and other things. So we need more of that happening, and we need, uh, we, we cannot rely on 14,000 urban, uh, 14,000 school districts to make things happen. Uh, my question is, our school is doing really well and uh, we are in the best 20 of the business schools uh, now. So what do you think that our school should do to sustain this position and to move forward to be at par with the Ivy League schools? The question is, what should this school do? Mm -hmm. Broad school. Yeah. Well, it should continue to do what it's doing, keep, keep uh, 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 and doing certain things better. And we're, they're excellent in certain areas, as you're well aware, and highly ranked in other areas, uh, uh, and not as highly ranked. And they, there ought to be greater collaboration with the engineering school, some of the sciences taking place on this campus, and, and the like. It, it shouldn't be just... Uh, uh, at one time, the business school was just a business school and uh, uh, did not collaborate or didn't have uh, courses in uh, other schools. That's all changed, and it's going to continue to change. Hello. I'm Blair Miller, and I'm alumna of the Executive MBA program and on the Board of Trustees for the Alumni Association. And uh, I read your book as I was heading off to Silicon Valley. I'm an entrepreneur bringing new technology for advanced manufacturing to Michigan. And so I was meeting with the venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, and some of your lessons learned I kept back in my head as I was meeting with them. And I wondered, my question is, what do you think are the biggest challenges for entrepreneurs today? And, and you've been successful in starting up companies. What do you think are the biggest challenges that we face today? Well, I don't think challenges have changed if you have a great idea and so on. Uh, You've got to move forward and, t and take risks uh, and, and, and convince people that what you want to do, whether it's a product or service, makes sense and get it accepted and get it financed. It seems like you talked about reimagining business. I mean, you took a home builder and you said that it became a manufacturer. You took a 
life insurer and you made it into a bank. Uh, and, and you talked about reimagining business and maybe on, uh, something along those lines uh, might be uh, some takeaways for us. Well, look, when we took Sun Life Insurance Company of America and we ran it for a few years as what it was, a boring regional life insurance company, frankly, uh, I said, we've got to find a market niche. It was very clear that uh, a niche was, uh, if you looked at the baby boomers and so on, you knew they had to save for the retirement. So we changed it to a retirement savings company and created a, a, a force of financial planners, created products, mutual funds, fixed annuities, variable annuities and the like. Uh, and w went ahead and did something that was unusual. We created a brand. At one time, we were the biggest advertiser for NBC Sports. So we're competing with a lot of big names, the Metropolitan, the Prudential, and others. And I think we did a pretty good job for, uh, from where we started uh, being viewed as uh, an important player in that industry. And I'm proud of the fact that that company for a decade was the best performing stock on the New York Stock Exchange, partially because all of the high tech companies were on NASDAQ. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and with that, we want to thank you. Thank, uh, thank very you. Much for being here. I, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.